Please be seated. Welcome to Mayflower Congregational United Church of Christ, where we believe that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Welcome to the fourth Sunday of our Distinguished Pulpit series. We are honored to have with us Devon Douglas from the city of Tulsa, and I will introduce her more later in the service. Robin sends his greetings from the mountains where he is with his family, but the joke's on him because it's only 90 here. Gracious God, we can explain the uptick in prayers offered lately. Oklahoma City public school teachers reported to their principals last week, students will show up this Tuesday, so of course there have been more prayers for patience, <laughs> prayers for calm, prayers for focus, endurance, and longer recess. On the surface, everything seems fine. The lesson plans are ready, the desks are in neat rows, and the pencils are sharpened. Now, if only there were enough books for each student, if only class sizes were manageable, if only there hadn't been a mass exodus of teachers heading to other states for more respect and better pay, if only, if only. We would pray for the teachers, Holy One, but we know that they are doing the best they can with the little they have been given. So instead, we pray for our legislators, the ones who chose gimmicks over responsible governing. In the past, we've asked that you grant them wisdom and courage. Today, our prayer changes a little. To wisdom and courage, we add heartburn. May our legislators' hearts burn with shame at the thought that they have chosen an industry over our children. We pray for their stomachs to ache at the idea that we are losing our best and brightest. Make them afraid, Holy One afraid of being called to account for their lack of courage. We pray for us too. May we be restless, unsatisfied, and uncomfortable until we have changed course, until every student, every teacher, every principal, every staff person, and every family in every corner of the city has what they need to thrive. It is our deepest call to carry on the work of abundant life for all. After all, this was given to us freely. We pray in the name of another teacher, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Our speaker this morning is Devon Douglas, who is the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Tulsa. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Sociology at Missouri State University and continued her education at the University of Tulsa College of Law. Passionate about service, Devon served her time as an AmeriCorps VISTA at the New Jersey Attorney General's Office. She moved back to Tulsa to work for the Oklahoma Policy Institute, a nonpartisan budget and tax policy think tank that all of us love dearly. <laughs> While there, she galvanized Oklahomans around issues of economic opportunity, racial equity, and asset building. This is how I met her. We spoke out against predatory lending practices together. Devon rattled off numbers and statistics like no one I had ever heard, and I knew we needed to hear more from her. I am so thrilled she agreed to speak to us today. Please help me give a warm welcome to Devon Douglas. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, great, you all are good at responding. 
That's always good. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me. It um, is an honor. Actually, when Pastor Lori invited me last year, um, I was just like overwhelmed and couldn't believe it uh, that she asked, you know, little old me to um, come speak to this lovely congregation. And since then, my honor has only grown. Um, and so a lot has happened um, since she has asked me to come here today. Uh, nearly a year has gone by and several things have changed. One, my job has changed. I formerly worked at Oklahoma Policy Institute and sometime between when she asked me and um, November, the mayor-elect, Mayor G.T. Mayor Bynum, asked me to work on his staff to do racial equity work in the role of the chief resilience officer. And there was another change of guard that happened um, in this country. We've had um, a new president, so to speak, and <laughs> um, and so I've I've seen, and what has come out of that is I've seen many things. One of the things that I've seen is the faithfulness of God, um, and I've seen that through many different emotions that people have shown. People have shown, um, you know, sadness. Um, mourning with other people who are enduring um, the tragedies of our time. And one thing that I have not seen enough of, and this may surprise you, is anger. And that's what I'm going to be speaking about today once I get my other um, information up here. So um, I'm very nervous, so please bear with me. Um, and while I'm waiting for this to happen, I want to thank my family for driving the long arduous drive down the turnpike this morning. It was, it was great, actually. I have good people with me, and they didn't make me drive, so I had the opportunity <laughs> to uh, kind of sit and relax um, as we made our way um, deep down into Oklahoma City. So um, I enjoyed that trip, and I'm <laughs> really thankful for you all, so thank you for coming along with me. Um, yes, so I would like to talk to you a little bit today about anger. Now, anger is, um, it's a hard thing for me to talk about as a black woman, right? Because the angry black woman is a trope um, and a stereotype that pervades um, our media and our conversations, our interactions with one another. As a black woman, when I speak, um, even if it's not anger, for some reason, whatever reason, people tend to pull out anger and see anger when I'm speaking. If I'm not smiling or jolly or telling someone a joke, then often people assume that what I'm saying is coming from a place of anger. And so being the Christian woman that I am, I've become introspective about this, right? I'm like, well, if other people find me to be angry, is there something that I'm doing wrong? So I searched the scripture and I wanted to figure out, you know, what what exactly does the word of God say about anger? And I came across many different um, scriptures that talked about anger, but one of them stood out to me. And I'm going to lead into it. I'm not going to start um, right at it, but I'm going to be reading from the New English Translation. I love this. In case you're like looking for a new translation to get into, I know all you Bible scholars out here, um, the NET is really good because there's like commentary and it teaches you things. And so um, that's the one I'm going to be reading from. And I'm going to start at verse 17. And it reads, so I'd say this and insist in the Lord that you no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to hardness of their hearts. Because they are callous, they have given themselves over to indecency for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Sounds familiar. But you did not learn about Christ like this. If indeed you heard about him and were taught in him truth, just as the truth is as in Jesus. You were taught with reference to your former way of life to lay aside the old man who is being corrupted in accordance with deceitful desires. I'm going to skip ahead. Therefore, having laid aside falsehood, each one of you speak with truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. And here's the key. This is the thing that blew me away when I first read it. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on the cause of your anger. 
And that was Ephesians chapter 4 from 17 to verse 26. Be angry. Such a revolutionary thing for me as a black woman. Something that's telling me in the face of this world in which we live that I'm allowed to be angry, but do not sin. So I was trying to think of in what situation should you be angry if you're not allowed to sin with it, right? So when you're driving down the street and someone cuts you off and then like these words fly out of your mouth, that's not a good example. <laughs> of being angry without sin, right? Okay, maybe your um, mother goes through your things um, when she visits you or something. I don't know <laughs> if I have experience with that. <laughs> and you lash out at her irrationally. Example of anger, but that's coupled with sin. So I thought, what are the examples? When do I have the opportunity to feel this emotion that... Um, that I so long to feel since everyone assumes that I'm an angry black woman in the first place. <laughs> and so what I find um, is that righteous indignation is always in order, always. When we are seeing the things that make God's heart hurt, what makes God angry should make us angry. Like for example, what we've seen in the city of Oklahoma City and the city of Tulsa where our city councilors decide that people should not be able to ask for alms on the side of the street. That should make us angry. It should make us angry that they're in that situation in the first place. Poverty should make us angry. Racism, which is sin, should make us angry. Sexism should make us angry. The things that hurt your fellow brother and sister are the things that should cause you to burn with rage. So the hard part about this, right, is that we're so taught that when we're angry, normally the response is something that's maybe sinful. And so where do you direct that anger? Now I was reading about this and I found an example. There's a woman whose daughter was killed by a drunk driver. Um, and she was burning with anger because she knew that this man would not receive the type of sentence that she so longed for him to have. Her 14-year-old daughter is mowed down by a drunk driver. And so she, in her anger, created Mothers Against Drunk Driving. There are so many ways for us to turn the anger that we feel about poverty, about racism, about classism, we can do something with this anger. And I have a few suggestions, if you don't mind. Since I have the microphone, I might as well go ahead um, and, and direct you a little bit. Um, one of the things that you can do when you have an anger built up about the injustices that you see in the world is to speak out when you see them happen. It's very easy for us to get comfortable and say, oh, I don't want to say it now because that's my friend or that's my daughter or that's Uncle Bob. Because Uncle Bob, we know how Uncle Bob can get. And we say, well, that's just him. But when you're burning with that rage, you don't have to lash out irrationally, but you should speak up on behalf of the people that Uncle Bob so often uh, denigrates. And beyond speaking up, there's ways to organize, which may sound familiar to you considering who that woman is over there. Um, there are so many people um, around the world who have their eyes on us here in Oklahoma. Um, I was just at the Global Summit for Urban Resilience in New York City where 79 chief resilience officers from around the world were there. And they were saying to me, but you're from Oklahoma, how did you all get chosen to be a part of this? So like all these really progressive people from around the world and they're saying, you know, how, what, what are they gonna do in Oklahoma? I mean, is there really hope? <laughs> um, and of course I'm biased, right? I believe that we can do it because I live here and I, I go to church with Oklahomans and I, I went to school with Oklahomans and I work with them. It's like, I live here. Um, 
And so there are so many people who are watching us, watching to see if we, it's not only a city in Tulsa, but as a state, if we can be truly resilient. And we are such a great example for the rest of our country. Because unlike people in Massachusetts or New York, we've been here. We live in a place where, um, where this type of rule, this type of hatred pervade, that we see at the national level pervades our local politics. But we can show people um, how to be resilient. We can use our anger to organize, to show people that we can move forward, not only as a city, Tulsa and Oklahoma City, and as a state, but we can be the city on the hill. We can be a paragon, an example for other people of what it looks like to use the anger that we so very much feel when we're on Facebook, and we can bring it out into the world. Now, some people, when they um, look at this scripture, they say, what does it actually mean to be angry? Right? It means like while you're angry, do not sin. But um, the way that I read it and many other scholars who are much more intelligent and well read than I um, interpret this is that in the original, um, in the original Greek, um, it's actually an imperative. It's actually an imperative. So many of us are sleeping and I hate the stay woke thing because it's very, um, it's just so ubiquitous now, but this is, this is good, right? Because so long, we, we want to hide anger. We want to push it down. It's not a polite and, and a good emotion. You know, good Christian people should not be angry. But here's the imperative right here. In Ephesians, a book, um, no less, that teaches us about core principles of Christianity. Um, and so I, I entreat you, therefore, sistren and brethren, um, to remember that the feelings that you feel when you see um, injustices in our world, that anger is not misplaced. But don't just sit with it. Don't become bitter Bettys and bitter Billies. Take that anger and unleash it out into the world as organized effort. Because everyone doesn't have the privilege that you all have here and they need other people to help them to speak out on their behalf. The children that um, Pastor Lori spoke about earlier that are going to be going back to school in the next few weeks, they need your voice because they've been so ignored. The teachers, they need your voice because they're being ignored. I don't know if you saw the woman in Tulsa who stood outside and um, you know, begged for money to um, cover the needs of her classroom. She needs you. The babies who will be in her class need you. Those parents, they need you. So use your anger. Be angry. Be angry and sin not. Thank you. Amen.